Welcome, happy warriors, to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where I, your rabbi, reveal how the world really works. Thank you for being a happy warrior. Thank you for waking up every morning and with determination, putting a smile on your face, thanking the good Lord for giving you yet another day to fight, another day to defeat the forces of resistance that try and stop you making the most of your family and your finances, your physical fitness and your faith, and your friendships, and you smile at the challenge because you are a happy warrior. And I am your humble rabbi. I remind you, as always, that the more that things change, the more we need to depend on those things that never change. And, uh, Certain things don't change. One of them is that travel is uh, is perilous. You know, travel is not to be taken for granted. About 150 miles off the coast of the west coast of Italy lie two big islands. The northern one is Corsica and the southern one is Sardinia. Corsica, of course, is where Napoleon was sent to exile in 1814, just after the chaotic and failed attempt to invade Russia. And um, I think it was, was it the Treaty of Fontainebleau, I believe, but whatever it was, he was sent to Elba. He didn't stay there for very long, less than a year, I think, and he escaped and went back to France. Um, his hope of regaining the emperorship and rebuilding France, well, not exactly, and he ended up uh, finally in the South Atlantic on the island of St. Helena where he died. But if you were to uh, travel as the crow flies from Rome and head off in a sort of north, in a westerly, northwesterly direction uh, towards Corsica, Well, about 10 miles away from the Italian mainland, you'd come to a tiny little island called Giglio, Giglio, uh, G-I-G-L-I-O, and um, exactly 10 years ago. And yes, I am now preparing this program for you on Thursday night, January the 13th, 2022. I tell you that only because I'm going to be uh, recognizing the 10-year anniversary of uh, a disturbing event. Um, and I mentioned the, the date of my recording, just so as you should know. But material that I'm sharing with you is absolutely evergreen, meaning that I uh, could have been telling you this 20 years ago, And I did tell some audiences this 20 years ago, not on a podcast, but in person uh, at my synagogue in uh, in uh, in on the West Coast. And uh, in 20 years time, you might be listening to this as well or in 30 years time. And it's still going to be relevant. I try as hard as I possibly can to make sure that the bulk of these shows uh, remain relevant all the time. But uh, today is the 10th anniversary of the wreckage of a ship called the Costa Concordia. And yes, it was exactly 10 years ago on the 13th of January 2012 that a Costa Line cruise ship, Costa is an Italian cruise line company that is wholly owned by the Carnival Cruise Line Company, and uh, the um, ship, the Costa Concordia, had just left a port near Rome, and uh, it was uh, being it was being captained by a man who turns out to have been a, a thoroughly incompetent man and more of a scallywag than a man. Why do I say that? Because 
in violation of time-honored tradition, he was uh, very early to leave the ship. Instead of staying on board till the last person had been helped off, uh, he jumped off fairly early and uh, rowed a lifeboat to land. Uh, the The ship um, uh, capsized, and it was only about 100 yards from land anyway. Many people did actually swim. A couple didn't make it. Uh, 32 people died, um, most of them passengers, some crew members, and um, the ship was carrying about, oh, I don't know, 4,200 people, well over 4,000 people. So, uh, you know, the overwhelming majority of people were got off. And uh, what happened was that the the captain decided to go particularly close to the island of Giglio. And this is not a, a completely rare and unknown maneuver. Uh, the idea was to give the people on the ship a close sight of the island, although it was after dark already, uh, and also to give the folks on the uh, on the island a nice view of this huge ship, more than a thousand feet long, um, gliding with all lights burning right off their coast. Anyways, uh, the captain was clumsy, he was careless, and uh, he far too late spotted a well-charted rock which he claimed is not charted but it's well known and um, it was on the port side and he uh, gave an order to steer hard to the starboard side well that did take the port further away from the rock which it was going to miss anyway but unfortunately it drove the stern of the ship right onto the rock and disaster struck and um and that that's what happened the the ship fell over onto its side um it was close enough to land so it did not sink it lay on its side but uh the lower decks and the engine room were all flooded and um as i say m- obviously most people got off it was not a nice experience it was really off rather awful and uh, the uh, the ship amazingly enough was then uh, salvaged now it there was it was severely damaged there was no hope of it ever sailing as a cruise liner again but uh, the key thing how do you get you know such a huge thing it's like the it's among the biggest moving things that humanity has ever built or, or big ocean liners how do you get it and it was really a remarkable process of salvage conducted by the salvage master who interestingly enough from south africa a guy called sloan a very very well known uh, salvage expert and uh, working in conjunction with an american firm titan salvage uh, which you may remember, years ago there was a, a a ship near Alaska that went down with hundreds and hundreds of Mazda cars on board. It, it didn't sink, but it got badly damaged, and Titan Salvage, I think, was the salvage company that was in charge of um, saving that ship, and working with Titan and an Italian company, Mike Sloan, um, actually managed to refloat the Costa Concordia, and by I think it was about two years later. By 2014, it had been towed to uh, Genoa in uh, Italy to be uh, cut up as scrap and sold, and that's what's happened. That's the end of the Costa Concordia. But there it was exactly 10 years ago uh, today. Those of you who have been happy warriors for a while, well, you probably know deep in your heart how urgently and compellingly I feel the need for you to succeed in your five F's, because that's what being a happy warrior means. You want to not only make sure that you do well, but those people who make up your family and your friendship circles, you want them to do well also. And that is very much at the heart of everything we do. And so a lot of the time I tell you about, you know, each of the five F's. I talk about fitness. And remember, we once spoke about uh, diet and eating and food. That was one of the shows. Um, You know, I might be speaking about finance or family. But more generally, from time to time, it is vitally important to discuss the techniques that you can use to improve your five F's. 
It's all very well to know that I must make more money or that I must spend more time with my family or I must nurture my relationship with my spouse or I must find a spouse. All of these things we know in exactly the same way that I know that to run faster, I must just move my legs more quickly and that to achieve more in each day, I just have to get up earlier in the morning. But to actually do these things require acts of will and So from time to time, like today, we also need to talk about the way you can take care of things that will increase your willpower, take care of things that will diminish your sense of internal indulgence and make you a bigger and stronger person. Uh, One of those things is a book that I've been talking a lot about lately, and a couple of months ago we actually interviewed the authoress, and, um, and the book is called Soul Construction. And this is really nice. This is an eight-step roadmap using principles of ancient Jewish wisdom uh, to move you up in order to make you a more effective person. So you know what the roadmap is. The roadmap are the five Fs. But you also need to know how to strengthen yourself so that you can actually take advantage of that roadmap. And so please go to the website at rabbidaniellappin.com and take a look at Ruchi Koval's lovely book called Soul Construction, because you want to construct your soul. That's what we're talking about. In the final analysis, when it comes to supreme acts of will, whether it's winning a, an Olympic 100-meter race or a four-minute mile, or whether it's building your business or your family or, or doing things for your friends, all of these things require a stronger soul than we've got at the moment. Um, And it's exciting because there's really no limit to the extent to which we're capable of building and developing and enhancing our soul. It's a good thing to do, and um, that's a good way to do it. So um, go to the website, rabbidaniellappin.com. You also want to make sure that uh, you are part of the Happy Warrior community because in the same way that uh, you will be strengthened by being able to connect and communicate and collaborate with other happy warriors, uh, you also bring added value to them by your presence. And so uh, there's an easy way to try out a a free Happy Warrior membership so you can be part of the community. And we set that up in such a way so as that uh, Susan and I would devote most of our time to the community that is most willing to invest in it, most willing to invest in their own growth as happy warriors and um, all of that is uh, something you can find either at happy warriors we happy warriors.com right three words we happy warriors.com uh, or at rabbi daniel lappin.com and um, you will be able to uh, be able to connect with us and connect with all kinds of other happy warriors as well so uh, remember that happy warriors are never tennis balls floating down the gutter of life and take action now so that uh, the the rest of this show uh, will fall on fertile ears because the rest of the show is I am explaining exactly what we're talking about things that reduce you or magnify you things that make you smaller or things that make you bigger And uh, they are things that will be extremely helpful in your lives and in the lives of uh, people that you are in a position to help and influence. So uh, with uh, no delay, let's move right on, shall we? Now, have you ever found yourself, uh, you know what, you probably don't do this sort of thing. You're you're law-abiding. You're not a rebellious redneck rabbi. But um, I I know that uh, every now and then, people do find themselves speeding down a road. It might be a a pretty spring morning, a deserted country road, and there's not a car in sight, and uh, you just decide right foot down, and away you go, exceeding the speed limit, but enjoying the way your tires cling to the road surface and the way the suspension allows you to throw the car around the gentle curves, and what fun. Um, There you are, 
and uh, you're you're pushing up close to three digits on the speedometer, and um, and if I were at that point to say to you, do you know why speeding is a bad idea? I imagine you'd you'd answer very directly. You'd say, yeah, of course. You know, I I know the answer. It's 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 pretty clear. Number one, there are. Um, idiots on the road they are careless people on the road they may do something inadvertent and uh, if you're traveling at, at at close to triple digits you just don't have time to react if something goes wrong uh, or there there might be a mechanical failure you know you might blow a tire or uh, there might be a little uh, um, early spring black ice on the road but whatever it is, unexpected stuff happens, and the faster you are going, the less time there is for error. And so for your ability to adjust your reaction by speeding, you're cutting down your available time to be able to do that. So you know that as, as well as anybody does. And knowing that, you know, I asked you and you told me, so you obviously know the reason that speeding can be dangerous. Uh, and yet there you are merrily careering down the road at top speed when all of a sudden you sweep around a bend and to your horror, right ahead of you, right on the side of the road, is the scene of a horrible accident that has just happened. The ambulances are there and the emergency medical teams are there and there's blood everywhere and it's a shaking and unnerving sight. Now, I have a question for you. As you drive on from now, how do you drive as you continue down the road? Don't you find yourself driving more carefully, more slowly, more cautiously than usual? Right? You're traveling slowly now well within the speed limit and you're concentrating in your driving like never before but it's a little bit of a mystery because you knew the reasons for not speeding before and you know them now why are you acting differently now you have no new information and if we are indeed rational human beings driven chiefly by our thoughts and our calculations, well, I don't get it because you have no new thoughts, no new calculations, no new data. You knew exactly what the risks are about speeding five minutes ago as you do now, and yet now you're driving slowly. <laughs> What's the difference? The difference is that you saw blood and you saw injured people. You were grabbed by the guts. That's what happened. You were grabbed by the guts. Your emotions are now at play. You've now witnessed one of the most awesome sights that face human beings, and that is the scene surrounding the end of life. It makes everybody serious every single time. And the truth is, you'll probably agree, that we human beings are endlessly fascinated by what happened before life and what happens after life. The process that introduces life and the process that ends it. And this is one of the reasons, I'm sorry to have to tell you, that uh, entertainment programming, films, television programming, they pretty much obsess around sex and violence. Why? Well, violence leading to death, the end of life, and sex, well, of course, being the structure that surrounds the beginning of life. That's what fascinates us as human beings, right? And, and when, a, when a baby is born, it's sort of amazing because here is a, a living, breathing, thinking little human being, you know, who was not here yesterday, extraordinary and uh, and we do uh, we we recognize the same thing the, the 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 frightening aspect of somebody passing on to the lord is that there he is and then the very next moment there he isn't and this fills us 
with fascination, not necessarily of, of a good kind, but very understandable. We are human beings uh, suspended um, uh, tenuously between life and death. And yes, we are fascinated by becoming and by stopping to be. So as, as human beings that are absolutely fascinated by the process that begins life and the process that ends life, look, we're, we're obsessed with these things. And you saw that. You saw that accident. And you saw the, the, the medical personnel and the ambulances. And you know somebody got hurt. And um, it's now emotional. It grabbed you by the guts. And you simply cannot drive fast anymore. In spite of the fact... <laughs> <laughs> that it just doesn't make any sense, right? Because strictly, from a, a logical point of view, you would have to admit that it would be easy for us to check with the Department of Highway Statistics, and you could tell that there are typically X number of accidents per 100 miles of highway road, and since you've seen yours for today, the likelihood of another one is reduced, all right, now I'm playing with statistics a little bit, but but there really, I mean, there's certainly no reason to drive more slowly now than there was before from a logical, rational point of view. What I'm trying to do, obviously, is point out that we are not nearly as rational and thoughtful as we think we are, and we are very much shaped by things that grab us in the guts. Now, you've got to realize that there is no intellectual reason for driving slower now than you were earlier this morning before you saw the accident. And the only reason that you, like me and most other people, would drive more slowly now and more carefully now after seeing the accident, it's totally an emotional reason. Our emotions were tugged by the side of the carnage by the side of the road. That's all there is to it. And so much for the deep desire that we all have to see ourselves as thoroughly rational, logical, intellectual beings that are motivated chiefly by our minds. We figure out what we want to do, and then we go and do it, right? Is that what we do, ladies and gentlemen, happy warriors? Wrong. We do what we want to do, and then we structure rational and logical explanations for why we did it. Let me, let me give you another example. It's, it's one I have very fond memories of. Um, there used to be a fair near where we lived in the state of Washington. It was called the Puyallup Fair. This was a very big favorite of the Lappin family. And uh, we would go to this fair every year, somewhere, usually September, October time is when it was. And uh, I used to enjoy taking my children to this fair. I mean, we used to love the animals and the, um, and, and the farm equipment. And there was just so much going on there that was quite wonderful. Um, but we also used to go and see... Uh, the the amusement park section, I, I forget what it was called, um, but it was um, a, a whole sequence of uh, terrifying um, contraptions that pass for entertainment. And people stand in line beneath the sh or in the shadow of the machine. And the machine is busy hurtling its victims around in at least three different directions and maybe more if there were more. And meanwhile, you can hear the screams of the victims all the way across the grounds. And my children urgently tug at my hands, making me move in the direction toward from where the screams are, are emanating. And we arrive there. And there's a long line of willing victims waiting to pay good money in order to have these tortures inflicted upon them by this diabolical machine. It always amuses me. It, it did amuse me. And uh, I'd always, with kids in tow, I'd go up to somebody in the line and I'd say, excuse me, are you not scared of dying in that machine? 
and the person would laugh at me and say, well, it is pretty scary, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm not really worried. And I'd say, why not? And he'd say, well, because if you look on the other side, you'll see when the machine stops, people come out and they're smiling and they're laughing. So there's no problem, really. And I say, OK, thank you. And I, I understand. Um, and, uh, you know, nobody's going to get hurt. So, um, so in other words, that person's intellect is telling his or her emotions that they've got nothing to be frightened of in spite of the fact that they're going to hear the screams of people who are now enjoying the ride. And, um, and so, yeah, I get it. It's fun to get on a ride where you experience near-death terror but you know full well that you've got nothing to worry about because all is safe, nothing's going to happen to you. You're going to come out of the end of it just like everyone else. So um, we wait and we watch, right? Because this person is demonstrating real mind over emotion. Yeah, he's hearing the screaming, but he says, my mind tells me it's safe, I'm not worried. And so uh, pretty soon we watch that person get on the machine and the machine starts hurtling around and guess who is screaming his head off. Now, if I was up there in that machine with him, I would tap him on the shoulder and I'd say, excuse me, a few minutes ago you told me there is nothing to be scared of because people get out of this thing alive every single time. Why are you screaming in terror? <laughs> what, is, what does he say to me? He says, Rabbi Lappin, forget what I said before. I just want this thing to stop. I am petrified. This is the scariest thing I've ever been on in all my life. I don't like this. I want out. That's what he'd say to me. Well, needless to say, the machine doesn't stop until it's good and ready to stop. And when it does, he steps out. And like everyone else, he's laughing and he's cheerful, filled with a great sense of accomplishment as well as at relief at being outside of this infernal contraption. And for the third and last time, I tap him on the shoulder and I say, I don't understand you. Before you went in, it, you were calm. It was your mind over emotions. You told me that although you hear the screams, you're not frightened because your mind tells you that you're going to step out of it perfectly safely. How is it that up in the machine, you were screaming your head off? Why didn't your mind just reassure you that there is nothing to worry about? Why were you screaming? And if he is honest, he would say to me, the answer is very simple, Rabbi Lappin. I can be as intellectual as you like while I'm standing in a line at the bottom of the machine. But when my body is being tormented and I am being subjected to stomach-churning physical sensations... That is not a time when my intellect is even heard. Its voice gets so soft, it's almost unhearable, un it's negligible. I cannot feel anything except what my body is undergoing. Well, these two experiences serve to show me very clearly the 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 uh, car accident thought experiment and the uh, and the county fair thought experiment and they both show me that the human being is motivated chiefly by three independent drives three independent categories of motivation if you like okay the first is the body the second is the emotions and the third is the intellectual the body, the emotional, and the intellectual. In the body area, we're talking about the enjoyment of food and drink and sexual intimacy, to name just three. In the emotional area, the feelings, the feelings of emotional comfort and of friendship, of an esteem of friends, a feeling of, uh, of, um, of, of sometimes even fear can be an emotion, right? These are, are feelings. So you can sit in your room all by yourself one day, and in spite of the fact that you are fully fed and you are not thirsty and you, you're warm and comfortable, you can still feel utterly miserable 
and you can feel depressed simply because you have allowed yourself to sink into a down mood of depression. On the other hand, there are people who suffer, whose bodies are buffeted by pain and feel enormous physical discomfort and who are yet able to make themselves feel emotionally happy. So the two do not necessarily go hand in hand. The question is, which is stronger, the pull of the body or the pull of the emotion? Well, before we answer that, let's look at the third category. The third category is the intellectual, where a person says, look, I know this is what my body is asking for. I know that this is what my emotions want. But I also know that this is what I ought to do. This is what I ought not to do. My brain, my head tells me that what my heart wants isn't a right thing. So, for example, I suppose somebody might feel an enormous pull to respond to a television shopping channel selling some useless knick-knack. And uh, somehow or another, you have this tremendous, irresistible urge to buy it. Or it might be on a shopping expedition. Or you just saw an advertisement, whether it's for a piece of clothing, a dress or a suit, or whether it's a new piece of electronics, whether it's a motor car, whatever it is, there is this overwhelming urge to buy it. And your mind, your intellect says, wait a moment, that's my emotion talking. Now I've got to apply my head, not just my heart. It's a lot of money. It's money that I could use for something else. This is something that uh, I may want, but is it something that I really want or really need? And then your emotions step in again. And they say, leave me alone, head. You know, Stop talking to me. This is what I want. It's going to make me feel good. I deserve it. That's you know what credit card companies love you to listen to, that voice. And then your mind, your head comes back and your intellect says, deserve it. Did I hear you say deserve it? And why exactly do you deserve it? And in irritation, your emotions pipe up again and say, look, I didn't ask for this debate. I don't want to discuss this. I just want to go and buy that thing. That's all there is to it. That's one kind of debate. Right? That is a, a, a head-heart debate, an intellect-emotions debate. But you can also have a head-body debate, right? A head-body debate. And, uh, you know, for instance, I don't know, think the alarm clock rings. You had a late night, the alarm clock rings because you said to yourself, I'm going to get up at 5 o'clock tomorrow morning and give myself an extra hour to read a good book before my day begins, and uh, and your mind is fully alert as the alarm clock goes off, and your mind says, "Goody, it ca- it got it, it, the alarm clock worked. It's time to get out of bed and start my day." And my body responds and says, "Please, just let me hit that disgusting, immoral contraption found on most alarm clocks, namely a snooze bar, something that." When I hit the snooze bar, it'll give me another 10 minutes of sleep. And so my body responds to my head. I'm just going to tap the snooze bar. 10 minutes isn't going to make any difference, is it? And then I'll get up. And your intellect says, that's really, really not a good idea. That's not a good way to start the day. You start the way, you're starting your day in an indulgent fashion and you're not going to be able to discipline yourself for the rest of the day because you've started it off in such an indulgent and and undisciplined way so uh, you you're, you're just going to end up not getting the things done you want to do today and the body responds to the intellect and says you stay out of this you boring head i don't need you in this discussion and so it's a debate and sometimes Sadly, it's the body that wins, but sometimes, happily, it's the head and the mind and the intellect that wins. And when it's the mind that wins more often than the body, we think of ourselves as self-disciplined. 
and we develop a sense of self-respect. Self-esteem, by the way, is when you try and placate yourself with, with, with when the body wins and you feel awful. And then you go and tell yourself, oh, it doesn't matter anyway. And you try and give yourself self-esteem, if you've ever had that experience. It's not a worthwhile exercise. You will never feel as good as you do when you've earned your self-respect. And that can only be done by making sure that the body is dominated by the mind. Another way, by the way, of course, and I've spoken about this under the F of fitness, is with exercise, working out, going to the gym, swimming, walking, running, jogging, whatever it is you do, no matter what, it is never as comfortable as sitting and watching your iPad. So your body and sometimes your emotions will say, leave me alone, not today, I need some rest, I have to have some relaxation. And your mind says, no, you don't. What you need to do is stick to your workout regimen. And sometimes it's a fight. It's a fight with the emotions. Sometimes it's a fight with the body itself. But one thing that anybody who works out regularly recognizes is that there is a tremendous high that comes when you keep an exercise regimen going. And the majority of that is high uh, stems from the internal sense of triumph you feel when you know that you have dominated your body. Your mind won the battle with your body. What a tremendous sense of accomplishment that imparts. Now, I do want to tell you that it's a lot easier for the mind to win the battle against the body. It is much easier to win the struggle against the body saying, let me stay in bed another 10 minutes. The mind says, don't be such a sleepyhead, don't be so lazy, get up and do what you have to do. And you know what? You feel good when you do that. You feel good when you force yourself to swim one more lap, or to run one more mile, or to go to the gym and do one more half hour of heavy workout. You really do feel good. You feel good that you won. And it's a lot tougher to win the struggle for the mind against the emotions, because the emotions have a way of sounding more logical, and certain phrases keep cropping up, and none of them are more dangerous than the word love, because that turns out to be the logical excuse for doing things that don't illustrate any love at all for anybody else. Maybe love of oneself. Uh, There was a rabbi who was a teacher of mine years ago who said, Love, when you say you love chicken soup or when you say you love turkey, does that really mean that you love the turkey? Of course it does not. It means you love yourself. If you love the turkey, you'd hardly be eating it. You're loving yourself. That's what you're really doing. And he said, you've got to be very careful with the word love. Very often, when a man says to a woman, I love you, it's not very different from him looking at the Thanksgiving turkey and licking his lips and saying, I love turkey. And that's very similar to when he licks his lips and looks at the lady and says, I love you. Not altogether sure that he really does. He's actually loving himself. And what he feels for the lady Maybe something quite different from love. But the language of love allows the emotions to cloud the intellect. And it allows decisions to subsequently be made by human beings. Very often decisions that can be regretted and most likely will be regretted later on. I'm sure this has happened to men whom you know. Have you ever heard of a man phoning up a woman whose number has been given and talking to her on the phone and becoming absolutely entranced with her voice and with her ideas and with her conversation? And he talks to her for half an hour, an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, sometimes longer. And sometimes he talks to her on the phone again another evening. And it may be quite a while before they finally meet. By the time they actually meet, he is so charged up. And he is so utterly convinced that this is the one woman in the world for him. 
that he is utterly shocked and brought back to earth when he meets her and sees her appearance doesn't match in any way at all what he had anticipated. What a shocker that is. Do you know any men to whom that has happened? I do. And very often he ends up spending as little time with her as he can get away with that evening, and he mutters some lame excuse and never sees her again. But then there is another kind of situation entirely, in which a man sees a woman across a room, or in a bar, or at a party, or at church for that matter, never spoken a word to her, doesn't know her name, walks up to her with some kind of introductory wisecrack, and deep down inside of him he says to himself, I have to get to know this woman, this is the woman for me, this is she, I've been waiting for her all my life. Based on what? Nothing but appearance. And so the question I'm asking you now is, assuming for the moment that a man can only trust one of his senses, either his eyes, seeing the woman across the room, or alternatively his ears, in a telephone conversation with her, but without actually seeing her, which man do you think is more likely to make a mistake and enter a marriage that he is likely going to regret? The man who marries a woman to whom he has talked a great deal but never seen, or a man who marries a woman who he has seen but hardly talked to? I don't think that we have to think for so long before realizing that eyes are not as reliable as ears. Okay? Think about that for a moment. Eyes are not as reliable as ears are. Of course, ideally, one would like to use both those senses in choosing a spouse. But the problem is that that's not always possible. And what I mean by that is that in the same way, as the guy riding the roller coaster, coaster or, or that whirly burly thing at the amusement park, uh, machines that are designed to terrify you, he may well be able to use his intellect to say, I know that people are coming out of there alive and safely and laughing, but he is still going to scream when the thing goes over the edge and turns him upside down. Why? Because the mind never trumps the emotions, and the mind never trumps the body. Those, the body and the emotions, have the ability to push harder. You know what, I, I, I just said never trumps, and that's not true. For happy warriors, uh, all the time, happy warriors make sure that their minds win out over their hearts and their minds went out over their bodies. That's part of what makes us happy warriors. Do we ever slide and fail? Sure we do. But we're in a battle nonetheless. We know we are. And we never pat ourselves on the back and give ourselves a loser's medal. <laughs> no, we're not interested in self-esteem. And, um, and we know when we've blown it. We know when we failed. So um, it really becomes incredibly difficult I want to almost say impossible for us to trust our ears when the eyes are in force as well, because eyes are tied to the emotions, ears are tied to the intellect, and it's much easier for the emotions to beat the intellect than it is for the intellect to beat the emotions, much easier for the eyes to beat the ears than for the ears to beat the eyes. I know so many instances when a man has missed an opportunity to marry a remarkable woman, perhaps the most amazing woman he would ever have encountered in his life, and he lets her go because her appearance doesn't match what he had locked into his, his mind. His eyes send a message to him that don't match the previous notion that he had constructed of what his ideal woman looked like. These are enormous problems. Um, I've, just, you know, I've been a coach and a consultant to so many men over the years, 
And not everyone ends as a happy story. Not everyone has a happy ending. Uh, these are huge problems. And when it comes to non-happy endings for guys, a lot of the time it's because their eyes beat out their ears. I tell people all the time that uh, if you, you know, to guys, I say, the only basis on which I'll be willing to introduce you to a woman, you keep telling me you want to get married, can't I introduce you to somebody? The only basis on which I am willing to introduce you to a woman is if you talk to her for a minimum of eight hours on the telephone before you meet her, before you Zoom with her, before you FaceTime with her, before you look at a picture of her. In other words, if you agree to keep your eyes out of this situation for at least eight hours, then I'm willing to go forward with you. I must tell you, not many men have agreed. There have been some, and those who have are very happily married. And I I, that's true. I know it sounds gl gl glib, but it isn't. It, it, it's really exactly how these things work. Uh, I'm not saying that there mustn't be a, a, an appearance of attraction. I'm not saying there mustn't be a, uh, a crackling electricity that comes from when they see each other. Sure, but there's got to be more, and that's, that's got to be sure, not to be the dominating force. So uh, in, in all of the areas in which this problem manifests itself, I don't think anything is more serious and none involves us in a greater struggle and perhaps none has more important consequences than the entire question of sex and marriage. Premarital sex is, is a really good place to be looking to understand this yes or no and I, I want to explain at the outset that although there's no question that our views in American society for the most part are derived from the central skeleton of Judeo-Christian principles I want to say unequivocally that the entire basis of what we call Western civilization, or perhaps we can just call it civilization even, is, is founded on the religious principles of Judeo-Christian Bible-based thinking. Now, as I'm talking to you now, I realize that, you know, I, I very often quote from the Bible and, uh, and I make no secret of the fact that I view the Bible as God's instruction manual for humanity, for the safe and durable operation of human society. But what I want to do in this podcast today is not quote from the Bible and not speak about this from a godly perspective. As you see, what I've been talking about is something that, regardless of your religious disposition, I don't think you're likely to disagree with very much that I've said at the moment. I've spoken about the thought experiment of the car accident and the thought experiment of the county fair, and I've spoken about eyes and ears, and none of this requires any kind of pre disposition towards uh, religious conviction. These are simple realities about human beings that we can all agree on, uh, regardless of, of what our religious or ethical or moral attitudes are. So I'm not going to discuss what is right or wrong, uh, because that's your decision. But what I want to do is only discuss whether what I'm telling you is true or not true. That's all. And so, while yes, it is true that, that God has directed that human beings should engage in physical intimacy exclusively within the bonds of marriage, that's, that is true. But that's not what I'm going to be talking about. And certainly, for many people today, that is not a sufficiently strong reason not to do it. So let's not talk about that at all, okay? Let's not discuss uh, the, the morality of it. Let's not discuss the religious side of it. And I, I want to say not only uh, 
did the good law decree that premarital sex is wrong, but he also indicated that there are very good reasons why it should not be practiced, why it is detrimental. And it's not because it irritates God. It's because it makes the chances for a successful life less likely. Think of this, if you like, as the difference between proscriptive and descriptive laws. This is a really important point. Um, this, what I'm about to say now, may perhaps be one of the most important parts of today's whole show. A speed limit, going back to <laughs> the discussion of the car accident, a speed limit is a proscriptive law. That means that uh, somebody sat in a bureaucrat's office and prescribed a speed limit of 55 miles an hour or 40 miles an hour or 70 miles an hour. He just put a pen on paper and said, okay, we're going to make this 70 miles an hour. And there'll be a penalty that'll attach to you if you're caught. This is a proscriptive law. It is proscribed that this speed limit exists and it's proscribed that a penalty will uh, afflict you if you're caught, but uh, it's not descriptive of any intrinsic reality. In other words, like me on that nice spring morning driving 96 miles an hour, I way exceeded the speed limit, but I didn't get caught. My car didn't disintegrate. Nothing happened. Everything was fine because it was a proscriptive law I was violating. And you can violate proscriptive laws, and if you get caught, you'll be punished. But that's all. But if you violate a descriptive law, that changes everything. See, Uh, if you violate a descriptive law, you can get really hurt. A descriptive law is the law of gravity. All right? Uh, Sir Isaac Newton basically said around about uh, the late 1600s, the early 1700s, he basically said, do not ever step out of the top floor of a 20-story building. That's what Sir Isaac Newton basically said. Because if you do, you're going to enjoy a very thrilling but very brief ride followed by a decidedly destructive sudden stop when you hit the sidewalk. And so if you try and violate the law of gravity, it's not a case of whether you get caught or not. It's not a case of whether there are any police on hand to see you do it. The law itself is descriptive of reality. Violate the law and the penalty will come to you automatically. No human agency needed. All right. But that's not the speed limit. If you travel more than 60 miles an hour, You're not going to suddenly dissolve into jelly. It's not going to happen. You'll only be in trouble if you get caught. That's the difference between descriptive laws and proscriptive laws. Okay. So when Newton said, do not step off the roof of a 20-story building, he was not proscribing an arbitrary law. He was describing a basic reality, which is that if you step off the top of a 20-story building, you are going to plummet with ever-increasing velocity down to the sidewalk. And you are going to be very, very hurt, not so much by the fall, but by the sudden stop at the end of the fall. That is Newton's law of gravitation. And in that context, I, I would love for you to understand that the fundamental permanent principles of Judeo-Christian Bible-based thought are not proscriptive, but they are descriptive. Right? God doesn't have to send policemen to catch you. Uh, God doesn't have to... Do, none of those things, no. There is an um, automatic consequence to violating a descriptive law. right? And that's simply because of the nature of reality. And that's the angle that I want to uh, continue on right now. I want to talk about the consequences of premarital sex. All right, and I mean, does God say it's wrong? Absolutely, but that's not the point today. The point is I want to tell you what happens in that process. It's a descriptive law. So 
what is the penalty? What, where, what is the downside? Hard to see, right? The point is that the process results in a penalty. And, um, and I, I think that um, we can start looking at some of the things that make it so. So the first reason is that, well, let me perhaps best describe it by um, giving you another thought experiment, if you like, okay? So imagine a friend of yours arrives with a bouquet of flowers, presents it to you, and you look a little puzzled, but you say, thank you very much, and you accept it. And a little later you say, well, you know, uh, I, these are beautiful flowers. I, is this for any particular reason? And the person says to you, no, I just appreciate you as a friend. I really do. And you say, well, well, that's really, I mean, that's so nice of you. And I appreciate you as a friend too. And for the rest of the day, you're thinking to yourself, you know something, I should do that as well. I should also express my appreciation to, to my friends because I really do appreciate them. And uh, you carry on about your business. The next day, that same person knocks on your door. When you go there, he's, um, he's got for you a set of golf clubs, if you're a man, or a beautiful, new, fashionable, expensive evening purse, if you're a lady. And, um, and, and you see a little card attached, okay? And, um, and the card says, to my dear friend, Rabbi Lappin, with best wishes from John Smith. And you accept the golf clubs or you accept the fashionable evening purse. And again, you say, well, this is really very nice of this person. But they gave me flowers yesterday. And today now they're giving me these golf clubs. I don't know what to say. And um, anyway, you, 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 know, you feel a teensy bit uncomfortable. But anyway, third day, the person knocks at the door of your house and says, you know, I just came here to tell you how much I appreciate your friendship, and, um, and I want to give you a gift. And he points down your drive, and there, parked at the sidewalk in front of your house, is a brand new BMW car uh, with a, a ribbon wrapped around it. Now, you're feeling completely baffled and bewildered, and he holds out a set of car keys, or these days a fob, and he smiles assuringly and he says, yes, it's yours. I've already registered it in your name. I want you to have it. Tell me, have you started feeling really uncomfortable already? And if you haven't, should we go on to the fourth day when he arrives with another gift and the fifth day with yet another gift? I'm sure you will agree that sooner or later, you are going to start feeling very awkward, particularly if the size of the gifts begins to approach a point where you don't really have the ability to repay in kind. Aren't you going to feel that the relationship is being damaged? Aren't you going to say to yourself that you can no longer retain an involvement with this person? You simply don't enjoy the feeling of imbalance. You don't enjoy the feeling of being a taker and never a giver. And you have been turned into such a taker that you can never ever put this right. Here you've got the core of why it is that being a recipient of charity corrodes the soul. This is one of the reasons that welfare and uh, social, and social uh, payments, as they're currently constituted, where many people in the country live on welfare payments and do not work, it's a thoroughly immoral system, not just because it's taking money away from some people and giving it to others, but it's because it's turning vast numbers of citizens from givers into takers. And uh, when you are a giver, you feel noble, you feel good, you feel enlarged, you feel morally upright. But as a taker, you feel corroded, you feel unworthy, subtly and sometimes subconsciously. 
but you finally get filled with a sense of incredible self-loathing. And so really, the government is doing the recipients of welfare no favor at all by not requiring them to work for their welfare check, no matter what the work is. It doesn't matter as long as it is work that allows the recipient to be thoroughly convinced that he is doing valuable work. It's work that is important and useful. And then the person after work goes home with his check and he feels like a really valuable member of society, even though he's been working for the government, as it were. But to be constantly put in a position of being a recipient, well, that corrodes the human soul. That creates damage. And you might already be able to see where we're going with this. I must absolutely clearly establish for you at this point, in some way that I know you will agree with me, and, and I need to stick with this as long as it takes, because I want there to be no misunderstanding about this point at all. Here it is. Here's what I want you to thoroughly understand. In the physical relationship between a man and a woman, I'm not talking about the marriage relationship per se. I'm not talking about the comprehensive relationship. But in the sexual relationship between a man and a woman, please believe me when I tell you that it is an unequal relationship. The man is much more of a recipient than the woman is. The woman is the giver and the man is the receiver. And that's one of the reasons that in literature going back as far as you like, these kinds of matters are discussed as the woman granting her favors, the woman giving herself to him. Now, I understand, of course, that uh, since about 1962 approximately, we have been experiencing a, a huge sexual revolution, and there's been an almost comically desperate attempt on the part of men to persuade themselves that this is a two-directional a two interaction that is just as important for a woman as it is for a man. It's just as good for the woman as it is for the man. And yes, on certain levels, I totally get it, it is, but you have to get that it's not equal. And, um, gosh, I don't know how to, uh, how to adequately, other than to beg you to really think about this a little bit and try and overcome the indoctrination of popular culture that has done so much to persuade you that a man and a woman entering into a physical relationship is like a handshake. It's, it's, a, it's a social convention. It's a hookup. It's as, it's as wonderful for him as it is for her. It's as wonderful for her as it is for him. And again, anybody who knows the abuse that women have been subjected to on the university campus in America, um, and women who've been indoctrinated to believe that they're just like men, and they go to a party and they drink just like men do in spite of the fact that alcohol has a hugely different impact on the female physical body than on the male, usually because she is she weighs less, there's less body there, and, um, and the woman becomes somewhat inebriated very quickly and very easily, and, um, and then there is a physical relationship. The guy is as happy as could be. The next day, he barely remembers it, if he does, he boasts to his friends. The woman is suffused by horrific humiliation. Why? If this is exactly the same, and it's just as valuable to her as it is to him, and it's not that he gives her or she gives him, it's just two people shaking hands, experiencing a mutual spinal spasm. That's all this is. If that were true, then there's no reason for the majority of women to feel as bad as they do after these drunken assignations. It's not the same. 
it is something that she gives away, and it's something that is valuable, and it's something that he gratefully takes, sometimes not so gratefully. When a couple goes out on a date, and this was true a hundred years ago, and it's true today, and this is shocking, my friends, but in order that you do not have to, I read some women's magazines, and I do them because there are nuggets of sheer gold every now and then, and one of them is uh, this article in Cosmopolitan magazine for women, really the harbinger of the sexual revolution for women, uh, in which the magazine argues to its young female listener, readers that, uh, that they absolutely must make sure that the man pays for the date particularly the first few. Why? If this is a totally equal relationship, what are you talking about? No, it's always understood, and deep in our hearts, you and me, we both understand this as well, that when you go on a date, the woman is bestowing her favors on granting the man her company. That's, that's how it is, and it's what it is. And it's, it's why it is that um, uh, I, was, I was fascinated listening to two uh, older women. They were former uh, flight attendants on an airline uh, in the 60s and the 70s. And uh, they spoke about uh, the stand. They had to be weighed regularly by their airline employers, and they had to dress a certain way and they were monitored very carefully for attractiveness and appearance, and, um, and they gigglingly, even now as, as older women, they, they spoke about how regularly they would get propositioned by passengers, and it was a treat. They used to love working the first-class cabin, they said, because um, on any flight they could count on being invited to dinner. What do you mean invited to dinner, I say? Uh, what you meant to say was you got invited to have dinner together, right? No, not at all. You mean you never had to pay for dinner? Oh, they like, we went to the best restaurants. Never, never opened our purse. Why is that? If this is an equal relationship, why wouldn't it be enough to say, hey, let's have dinner together. You'll enjoy me as much as I enjoy you. And maybe she will. But nonetheless, it's understood that if he invites her out for dinner and she accepts, she's doing him a favor. He's happy about that. He'd rather have dinner with a pretty woman than by himself. And he understands that by her granting him that favor, he pays. That's how it works. That's the basis of the deal. So uh, that's why almost without exception throughout the world, it's men who go looking for women. Now, sometimes these days particularly, women go out to places where they can be found. But the actual act of going to look for women, that's what men do. Women do not go out looking for men. Are there exceptions these days? Sure, because women have become masculinized over the last few decades of uh, American cultural uh, damage. But in general, this is the principle. Uh, I want to say one more thing on this, and that is that men without women are far sadder creatures than women without men. You see a group of women out for the evening at a lounge or at a bar. They don't look sad or miserable or desperate. For the most part, they're having a good time. But if you see a group of guys out and you know they're hoping to find some girls, they've got a hungry look to them. You can tell. You can really see that it's not an equal relationship. Men are the getters. Women are the givers. And um, that's, that's really how it was. So um, single women, single women are generally not a problem to society. In, in past years, single women often became the... the uh, unmarried teacher who ran the, the one-room schoolhouse. Um, women, some t Single women became nurses, particularly in warfare. Uh, but single men, 
well, if you turn them into soldiers, that's well, that's one thing. But other than that, uh, single men in general cause a difficulty. I've spoken before about uh, my regular communication with uh, law enforcement specialists, and I I'll, I'll always check up and I say, what are the main characteristics that unify those people who perpetrate violent crime? Not exclusively, but overwhelmingly, male, single, and fatherless. You want to know who commits most violent crime? Or oh, here's a better way of putting it. Would you like to try and bring most violent crime to an end? It doesn't require more incarceration. All you've got to do is make sure no boys are raised without fathers. That's all. End of story. That solves the problem. Yeah, society does not prosper from single men. Right, and uh, the the thought experiment I've told you before on this show is that if your car uh, failed and your cell phone had no battery and it was late at night, you know, one o'clock in the morning and you're in a deserted road and you pull to the side of the road and you get out of the car scratching your head trying to figure out what to do and then you see six figures approaching you from the far end of the alley silhouetted by a traffic light and you get pretty worried. Now, will you or will you not be less worried when they come closer and you discover it's not six men, but it's three men and three wives? Don't you heave a sigh of relief when that happens? That's because you realize deep inside of you these things we're talking about are true. Marriage civilizes men. Marriage is desperately needed by men, I should say, marriage to a woman. Men really, really do need women. Women do not nearly as urgently need men. And that's why widowed men never last nearly as long as widowed women. In other words, uh, there are retirement communities around the world that have plenty of widows, but not a whole lot of widowed, widower guys, because men without women don't last long. Women without men last a lot longer. This is a sad, sad but true fact of life. And so in the sexual relationship, man is the recipient far more than the woman is. The woman is the giver far more than the man is. A man seeks the favors of a woman. In fact, it used to be called a sexual favor. She was granting a favor. This is not a handshake. This is not a spinal spasm. This isn't just the friendliest thing that two people can do when they meet. Don't make that mistake. So if you think about it, and you weigh up your life experiences in the context of what I'm saying, I don't think you'll have any doubt about this whatsoever. This is not a thing that a man and a woman simply do for each other or to one another. It is something that a woman grants to a man. She gives and he gets. That is not to say that it has no significance to her. Obviously not. That is not to say that she has no pleasure involved. No, of course not. These things are obvious. But fundamentally, it is a man receiving and the woman giving. Now, this helps, I think, to explain something that uh, really puzzled me. When I first arrived in Los Angeles... And um, I had just opened a new synagogue on the Venice oceanfront. And um, I was taken for a drive one night by a new friend. And I, again, I just got to Los Angeles. And so obviously the allure of Hollywood, you know, the glamour of Hollywood. I mean, I've, I've seen movies all my life. I'm now in Los Angeles and the friend says, would you like me to drive you through Hollywood? Yeah, yeah, please, go ahead, please. And um, we go, and uh, to my astonishment, Hollywood's rather squalid. I mean, you drive along Hollywood Boulevard or Boulevard or Sunset Boulevard. Yeah, there are, there are glamorous and elegant blocks, but there's also quite a lot of squalor, too. And um, at a certain part of Hollywood, I saw a Ladies of the Night applying their trade on the street corners and I was fascinated because I hadn't seen this um, in, in this kind of way since I'd been in Frankfurt, Germany 
that's another story entirely. And I said to the friend who'd been taking me around, please stop right here, just pull in and park. Um, and he said, I can't do that. You know, he said, don't you understand? We're going to be approached. You know, we can't do that. And I said, don't worry about it. You know, just if we're approached, and sure enough, we were. But he said, what, what do you want? And I said, because I don't understand. I've got to see what's going on. Um, the sexual revolution has been going on for years and years. Why would anybody still need to pay a prostitute? It doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand. Anybody short of someone being thoroughly physically unpleasant or unsanitary can find himself a girlfriend with whom he will be able to initiate intimacy, right? I mean, that's not a hard thing. Why on earth are there people driving around Hollywood Boulevard negotiating with women of commerce? And he said, well, I can't stop it. I said, yeah, just stay where you are. Stay parked. And, um, and I didn't care if we were approached. I just, I want to see what's going on. I want to see how thoroughly ugly, disreputable, and nasty looking are the men who obviously unable to find any woman in an ordinary relationship are over here buying women. I just don't get it. Well, I must tell you, we certainly were approached in the next 10 or 15 minutes by several ladies, and we quickly explained that we were not in the market. We were merely observers. Uh, I had an opportunity, though, to see the men who stopped to pick up these ladies. And i got to tell you, they had almost without exception. They were all nice-looking guys, all driving reasonably well-maintained, late-model motor cars. They were well-dressed. I was flabbergasted. I couldn't understand. There wasn't a single one of those men who looked to me like a guy who would have had any trouble getting a date in any bar in the city. And I couldn't wait to get back home until I could make a phone call. And late that night, but it was early the next morning in Europe where one of my teachers lived, and I called up and I introduced myself. And he said, yeah, what can I do for you? And I said, I have a problem. And I described the situation I've just told you. And I said to my teacher, can you explain to me why in Los Angeles at this point in time it is necessary for men who are obviously good looking and well groomed and have money in their pocket to have prostitutes? Why? And my teacher sounded a little disappointed and he said, I can't believe you have to ask me that question. Think about it. Think about it for a moment. He said, if your son, and now I'm going to pose this question to you too, the exact same question that he posed to me. If your son, God forbid, came to you and said, Mom, Dad, I am tonight going to go out and find a woman. That is a given. I'm going to spend the night with a woman. There is nothing you can say that is going to change my mind on that. The only way you can influence me is... You can influence me whether I go to uh, a bar near the local university and seduce a young co-ed to uh, coming uh, back to my room and spending as much time with me as I want her and then kicking her out in the morning. Uh, or alternatively, um, I am going to uh, go to Hollywood Boulevard and I'm going to find a woman who I'm going to pay to spend the night with me. Which should I do? And you have to ask yourself very carefully now, what would you tell your son? Especially if you have properly internalized the subject matter of this podcast, and you realize that, number one, people who receive without giving become spoiled, corroded, they become damaged human beings. And number two, that the woman is mainly the giver in the interaction. Now, what do you say? Where, let's take it as a given now that your son is going to undergo a certain amount of damage. He's doing something. Neither of these two actions is perfect. Neither is something you want to hear your son telling you he's going to do. But if you have no choice, he's going to do one of those things, but you can choose which one. There's no question in your mind. Of course he must rather pay. And again, leaving aside issues of health and 
uh, and uh, dan- da- uh, danger and etc. It's leaving all sides. This is a thought experiment. We're confining it to the basic facts, if you don't mind. And under those circumstances, uh, yeah, exactly. And and so um, th- th- there's no question at all as to which way we're going to go. We're going to tell our son what we'd rather. He does, not happy about it, but if that's the only choice, I'm going to pick the one that is less damaging. And, uh, and so at least my son will not be a participant in hurting a woman because when she has dinner with him that evening and they then have drinks and then he tells her to come back with him to his hotel room, she does that assuming that this is the start of a relationship. No matter what is going on in her heart, she believes. And when all the hormones begin to flow and the physical interaction is over, she lies there with a dreamy smile on her face, believing that she has found her love. And then he kicks her out and that's the end of it. Never phones her again to do that to a woman is so callous and so cruel that it cannot be done without inflicting self-damage as well. And so you soon realize that your son is better off paying a professional lady than seducing a hopeful girl. Being a recipient of charity corrodes a man's soul. Being a taker and not a giver reduces you in your own eyes. When you look at yourself in the mirror, you are filled with a sense of self-loathing that you never saw there before. At least when a man pays a professional lady, he walks away from that encounter and feels like a man. He didn't take advantage of anybody. Everything was clear and everything was paid for. It was a deal. He received the physical intimacy he wanted in exchange for something that she valued. And there was a transaction that left him feeling like a man. But in the case of the son, who simply goes to a a bar near the local college and seduces a young co-ed, and he leaves her with absolutely nothing. He has been a taker, and not a giver. And even the most arrogant and self-centered egotistical man can hardly successfully persuade himself that the thing of value that he has left the woman with is simply the memory of a night with him. I mean, are there really guys who could tell themselves that? I don't think so. Um, so uh, it's, it's very, very clear. Uh, the law of supply and demand, if you still need confirmation, the law of supply and demand would, uh, would verify it, wouldn't it? Um, the supply of available men that would happily have a relationship with a woman if she's available is almost unlimited. The number of women willing, that's very, very limited. It's very different. The number of willing men vastly outnumbers the number of willing women of women um, willing to grant it, as it as it were. That's pretty obvious. And so uh, uh, you can see that for your son to be able to look at himself in the morning with a little less self-loathing um, happens if he paid his way rather than if he was merely the recipient of a girl's favor without having done anything at all for her. And that's, of course, one of the reasons, as I said earlier, that people take a woman to the theater or they buy her dinner. All of this in the hope, on on some deep level, creating a kind of equivalence about how they hope the evening is going to end, how he hopes the evening is going to end. That's what it's about. And women understand that as well, which is why uh, women very often will not want to go for an expensive dinner or to receive expensive gifts because they realize that that makes the man feel that they are now under an equivalent obligation. 
it, I mean, I'm hoping this is becoming to coming quite clear to you in every way. This is something that every happy warrior should understand. So um, the the main reason here that I'm I'm trying to explain why I believe that premarital sex is well a, a dumb idea, really, is that not only is the woman giving away something of huge value while getting very little in return. But the man is injuring himself in a way that is almost irreparable. On a deep level, even if this is not consciously felt, even if he somehow did manage to say to himself, well, she wanted to do this as much as I did, that may be something he is telling himself. But the fact remains that he must know on some deep level that he has been a taker, not a giver. Now, uh, let's go back to some of the earlier discussion as we begin to uh, bring our show for today in for a landing. Um, We spoke about the body being far stronger than the intellect, that it's much more difficult for for the mind to fight the body than it is for the body to fight the mind. Spiritual gravity is on the side of the body. Now, I think that's axiomatic. And another axiom is that in uh, deciding on a marriage, you really need your wits about you, right? I mean, if, if there's ever a time you need to make sure that your mind is working, that would be when you are making a decision about spending the rest of your life in tight bond with another human being. And so um, you'd think That if we have to be careful about that, that um, the one thing that is happening is that exactly at this point where you are getting to know this person well and you're trying to make up your mind, this might be the person with whom I'm planning to spend the rest of my life, and now intrudes one of the most important and strongest bodily sensations by far, that aroused by the activity of premarital physical intimacy. And now you've got your body yelling powerfully, yes, yes, oh, this is fantastic, this is the person. Your mind that may be analyzing certain flaws. Maybe there are things you have to discuss with him or her in advance. Maybe there are sort of agreements and, and understandings you have to get out of the way. But if the couple is engaging in intimacy, it is impossible because the intellect that is so urgently needed at this point is being drowned out by the incredible power of what they're feeling in sensation. So everything is arguing in an effort to overcome your mind's discipline. And let's face it, there's not much more, anything that is more overwhelming in the human experience than sex. That's obvious to almost every human being. And so the question you've got to ask yourself is, how badly do you want sexual intensity to cloud what could become a very important relationship. You see, the fact that sexual intensity can cloud things after marriage just as much as they do before, and make no mistake, they do, but it's great after marriage. It's an enormous advantage because after marriage, the intensity of the physical intimacy tends to obscure any little irritating mannerisms that one spouse or the other might have. Part of the delight they take in one another physically helps them to completely overlook, to not even notice, to be utterly indifferent to whatever little annoyances in them that other people find absolutely insufferable. And that's wonderful, right? This is just one of the great lubricants of marriage. But think about what happens before marriage, before that commitment has been made. That same intensity clouds decisions obscures judgment and some perfectly obvious major character flaws, major incompatibilities that any objective outsider would have seen immediately as a fatal obstacle to a permanent union can no longer be seen by the parties themselves. 
because the intensity of the physical experience completely obliterates the mind's input. And so um, these are, are some of the ways that looking at something that today's culture takes absolutely for granted, um, but which I still thought was worthwhile examining, even though I sound like a dinosaur, and even though uh, almost nobody anymore debates these issues, um, I think they are worth debating. I think they are worth looking at, and uh, particularly for serious young people who are serious about being married and staying married, then these are surely things that are worth thinking about and talking about early in the process. Uh, How young can you be to hear uh, this show? Well, that depends on parents, I think. Parents have to decide, and uh, that's exactly what parents will do. So um, we have, as some of you may know, uh, a wonderful book in our store, our e-store at rabbidaniellappin.com. It's called Hands Off, This May Be Love. And if you know anybody who is at the courting stage of life, the dating stage of life, um, somebody who is um, beginning to think seriously about marriage, go ahead and get them this book and uh, you'll be delivering something to them of inestimable value. The name of the book is Hands Off, This May Be Love. In other words, if this stands any chance of being the real thing, don't wreck it by using your hands, and the implication is obvious. And um, uh, you'll find this book, Hands Off, This May Be Love, at the stored rabbi daniellappin.com. You definitely want to take a look at that. You also definitely want to make sure that you have downloaded the free ebook, The Holistic You. That's also at the website rabbi daniellappin.com. And make sure that you have tried out a free Happy Warrior membership so that we can grow our community and so that there are more people with whom to interact within the community, the community of happy warriors that I am so proud to be a part of and that so I am so happy you have been helping to grow so very effectively. So until next week, I remain your rabbi as I wish you a week of active, deliberate, growth in your five F's, your family, your finances, your faith, your friendships, and your physical fitness. Yes, I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin. God bless.